Hey, hey, we're back again after, what, a two-week hiatus? Yeah. Yeah, uh, we needed it. I mean, there's uh, some crazy stuff that went on. Uh, I think you had kittens. We had kittens, yeah. Had kittens. Took an astray, had kittens. Uh, that was one week, and the week before that, apparently I was an hour too late with completing the script, and you uh, opted out on me because you were tired from moving well, Yeah, uh, you know, I appreciate punctuality <laughs> is what it was, and when you show up here and you don't have all the stuff, well... Yeah, well, you get bounced out of the studio. Anyway, we're we're at it again this week with the uh, with the black eyed kids. So hopefully you'll stick around, uh, hear the uh, live discussion at the end. We'll be doing that a bit later, and then uh, not before the the scripted version up front. So without any further ado, without any flashy introduction, uh, you know what? We forgot to mention at the end. Uh, stick around to the end. Stick around for the end uh, for the musician spotlight this week featuring Eerie Death Rattle. Uh, without further ado, uh, this is the Supernatural Tendencies podcast. I'm Alex. I'm Christy. And this is episode 34, The Black Eyed Kids. There are many archetypal human fears. Spiders, snakes, and heights are among the top. Things that, through evolutionary lines and experiences, we have come to commonly avoid. But what we're going to talk about today tends to ride the line of our basic instinct to protect and nurture, that is, children. Kindenschema is a term that describes the attributes that endear babies to most people. Attributes including forehead height, a chubby face, in an eye-to-head proportion, larger eyes typically being considered cuter, the black-eyed kids' eyes are one of the reasons they seem to repel individuals who encounter them. As we will see today, whatever may be the driving force behind this strange phenomenon may be using our own psychology against us. The real questions are why and to what end. Admittedly, the case of black-eyed kids, what we may shorten to BEKs at some point, may be more of a modern urban legend than anything. Muddying the waters are numerous creepy pasta stories that seem to be thrown in at every corner, not really identifying themselves as fact or fiction. If you are unfamiliar with what creepy pasta is, it can be boiled down to this a story told mainly through internet forums, most recently through Reddit, for example, that is meant to scare you. A lot of creepy pasta stories are used as writing practice for some people and are never really admitted as such. This brings us to the interesting case of the BEKs. It is possible that they have been brought into the limelight of popular interest on the back of this possible fictionalized writing practice of sorts. Black-eyed kids aren't the only one in this same boat, though. Figures such as the Slender Man would also be in the same family of stories. But how can we decipher what are actual encounters from a high school or college writing assignment. If the writer is talented enough, it may be tough. We have to start somewhere, though, and we shall start with what the black-eyed kids are exactly. Thankfully for us, their name does most of the work. They are children typically ranging in the age from 7 to 16. Their skin has been described as pale and sometimes olive in color. Obviously, from their namesake, they have black eyes. Completely black eyes. From quote-unquote reports, the sclera, being the white part of one's eye, of these children are overtaken entirely by blackness. No discernible iris or pupil can be distinguished. But these are not the only defining characteristics that may be unsettling. In fact, the oddest thing about them is nearly unexplainable. People who have encounters with these underage entities describe a crippling fear or an extreme uneasy feeling surrounding these children. This may be explainable by the presence of their unnatural black eyes, but as we will see later, this probably isn't the case. They seem to simply ooze bad vibes that saturate everything around them. Furthermore, most people who have encounters with these off-putting fiends don't even notice their abyss-like eyes at first glance. For a yet unexplained reason, 
the witnesses are drawn in just enough by these children to only realize their unusual fear response to them, but not their most striking physical characteristic. As with most segments done on this subject, we will have to start with the first verifiable account. Since there aren't many stories of specific black-eyed kids before this one, our exploration has to start not too long ago, in 1996. Brian Bethel, a journalist in Abilene, Texas, would find himself sitting in his car to write a check. He would be so engrossed in what he was doing that he would be unaware that two boys had approached the driver's side window of his car. It wouldn't be until the elder of the two boys tapped on his window that Bethel would be startled from his concentration back to reality. Bethel instinctively rolled down his window to find a wave of fear wash over him. But as with the majority of cases, he couldn't explain why. The older boy then spoke, telling Bethel that they wanted to see a movie at the local theater, but they had forgotten their money. The boy asked if Bethel could give them a ride home to retrieve the money, and added that they were just two kids and that they didn't have guns. While being old enough to not raise any alarms about them being out alone to see a movie, the addition of these last two assurances would leave Bethel a bit rattled. Who would suspect children of having guns to warrant these comments? Furthermore, them saying that they were just two kids added an element of cinematic flair that would make anyone who grew up with 80s horror flicks take pause. Bethel then reminded the kids, and himself, that even if the children lived close by, by the time he could run them to get the money and return, the movie would be certainly mostly over. While not entirely realizing it, Bethel managed to break eye contact with the boys, making their trance-inducing conversation take a turn for the horrific. If it were even possible, a more intense wave of fear washed over him. When Bethel's gaze returned to the boys, he now noticed that both of them now had eyes that resembled a starless night sky. The boys started to become agitated and more insistent with Bethel that they needed a ride, but he had to invite them into the car. At this point, Bethel heeded his intuition and sped away from the boys, leaving them in the same mysterious circumstance into which they had walked. While Bethel still maintains that every aspect of his story to be true and factual, Mr. Bethel would also add an interesting food for thought on the same day that he reported this incident. Being a journalist and proto-blogger, he had also made a post to Alt.Magic discussing the idea of the Bloody Mary urban legend. The following is an excerpt from his post. Quote, then I thought to myself, what a situation ripe for a spontaneous expression of magic. The will, in this case, is the belief, especially among those who were brave, foolish, enough to try the ritual itself. The method by which the necessary reality shift would be accomplished is the fear the story and the imagined entity produced. So can we create something like Mary just by collective force of will? If not just childhood legends, why not gods and goddesses as well? Are they all just expressions of enough collective reality shifts? Or can they somehow exist on their own? While not trying to nip this story in the bud too early, but if we examine the content of Bethel's post, which, again, he wrote on the same day as reporting his BEK encounter, we may find some very telling things. What Bethel is essentially speaking is that of a mystical concept of tulpas. The idea of tulpas originated from the Tibetan concept of spropa, meaning emanation or manifestation. While being a very complex spiritual theory, we can explain it as such. A tulpa is a mindset that, when channeled, can bring to life sometimes spiritually, sometimes physically, an entity used for whatever purpose the initiator intends. This could be for protection, guidance, or anything, really. But there is a caveat to this practice. Even if the tulpa is created with good intentions, and yes, you can create a tulpa with bad intentions, at some point it is possible for the tulpa to gain sentience and take on a life of its own, to do what it wants, when it wants formulating its own intentions, whatever that may mean. To add further concerns, tulpas may not even need to be manifested from a specific practitioner. The theory holds that they can manifest out of thin air if many people believe in the same entity. 
This may unknowingly give enough combined energy to a thought to allow it to physically manifest itself. Wow, that is a lot to unpack. We can simplify it this way. While there may not be a literal jolly man in a red suit that comes to the house of families every Christmas Eve, by using the Tulpa theory, if enough people believe in the existence of Santa Claus, their combined belief may give the idea enough spiritual power to physically create a real flesh and blood Santa Claus. A more sinister twist on this idea could be that of the aforementioned Slender Man, a story for another day. Why this is important to our story is because that means even if these entities in particular may not have had a significant presence before Bethel's story in 1996, simply by the popularity of Bethel's story and the continued story sharing of other BEKs could be lent enough belief to become real. Could this be the explanation to Bethel's encounter? A spiritual experiment gone awry? After Bethel's well-known story, accounts began to be reported much more frequently and with many variations. Some say they had seen odd children of the same description playing outside of abandoned places, some trying not to make eye contact but still holding conversations in an adult manner with vocabulary beyond their perceived ages. Others provide varying skin hues, such as tinted blue and occasionally green. But most often, a pair of boys are said to approach people's doors at a late hour, knocking and requesting to come inside to use a phone. Ryan Sprague from JimHerald.com wrote a fantastic article in 2015, delving into some of the stories of the Black Eyed Kids. While we won't go through them all on here, check them out in the blog or Jim Harold's podcast if interested. Sprague does lead us into antiquity with the help of researcher David Weatherly. Weatherly explains that he intended to compile stories of these entities from before the television and internet era in an attempt to sidestep the risk of story corruption when being passed down via the media. While Bethel's account would explicitly use the term black-eyed kids, Weatherly wanted to circumnavigate the term since it seems to be a newer one. In his book, The Black-Eyed Kids, Weatherly unloads factual stories as well as folklore dating back to ancient China, as well as carvings from the ancient temple of Gobekli Tepe. One of the theories of the origin of these frightful children is that they are the souls of children who have died prematurely. Weatherly would provide folkloric background for this thesis by citing the same belief in ancient China, where many think that the angry spirits of children will torment whole areas after being taken by natural disasters. To what end the revenge might go in a modern context is still unclear. Gobekli Tepe, being possibly the oldest holy site in the world, has its own depiction of a solid-eyed entity. The Urfa Man, carved more than 13,500 years ago, still stands the test of time. Widely considered the oldest naturalistic-sized human carving, it was unearthed in 1993 in southeastern Turkey. Standing at almost six feet in height, the Urfa man dons a V-shaped crest across his chest and has his hands crossed across his pelvis. But the most striking feature may be his eyes. Inset holes house two carved obsidian marbles, if you will, giving the sculpture an ominous feel. Viewers of the statue have expressed how, upon seeing it, an uneasy feeling washed over them. Could this be just a universal human trait to get the hebes from holy monocolored eyes? Or is there some connection with this statue from long ago and the alarming adolescence with black eyes of today? We're not quite done with our examples from antiquity just yet. The book Your Haunted Lives, The Black-Eyed Kids, written by G. Michael Vassy, recounted native Iroquois legends known as Atkin. Vassy describes the Atkin as such. Quote, the Iroquois Indians believed in a dark power called the Atkin that could take over children, and an evil one who would mate with human females to produce black-eyed, chalky-skinned children. These children were killed by the tribe soon after birth, and burned to stop them from resurrecting. Children watering alone in the woods could also be taken over by Otkin, who would re-emerge with black eyes and pale skin, acting nervously while repeating themselves over and over. Their goal was to destroy the tribe and infect all the people with Otkin. Demonic entities, vengeful spirits, 
Anyone's guess is as good as the last at this point. But let's put the cherry on top as far as theories go. With all the reports of a special, invisible barrier that seems to prohibit the BEKs from entering, unless permission is given, one can't help but think of another creature who is held to the same standard. Vampires. Whether by some unspoken covenant that can't be broken, or being held in check by an innate spiritual wall of protection, both creatures can't seem to simply barge in and take whatever it is it wants. Any witness must be willing to participate in whatever mischief may ensue. While being overwhelmed with fear, one can simply close the door, or drive off, to avoid much more than goosebumps, at least as far as we know. But why? How? Even if one isn't overly religious, or faithful to any deity in particular, it still appears to be an unbreakable bond that can only be bargained with by acceptance. We can also connect the trance-like state that witnesses appear to be placed under while speaking with the BEKs. This sounds vaguely reminiscent of the vampire's folkloric capability to silver-tongue their way into the hearts and bloodstreams of many. Although this is seemingly where the similarities end, since no one has come forth stating that they have busted out a mirror to find a lack of reflection from the pint-sized nightmares, we can't be sure. Until the day someone has the opportune moment to throw a handful of garlic at a duo of pushy, demon-eyed preteens to see if they fall over themselves like the archetypal 1950s housewife at the sight of a mouse, we'll leave this one open for debate. To be honest, if we wanted to talk about every story involving the BEKs, we could make a 10-part series. And while we would love to do these entities that amount of justice, this seems to be a bit overkill. To that point, we'll leave the story searching to you. But we will leave you with this. Among everything that we've covered thus far, we haven't really discussed what happens if one were to oblige these suspect children. Most of the stories would only allude to the idea that those who have, have met terrible ends, and thus are not able to tell about it. Although one purported story would describe the possible fates of those who do. The following story was emailed to weekandweird.com. Let me start by saying that I know how hard this all will be to believe. But now that things have taken a turn for the worse, I started looking for stories similar to mine, and found Week in Weird. I feel like I should share this story with someone, and your website seems like the right place. I made the mistake of letting the black-eyed kids inside, and now I'm worried that I might die because of it. I hope this will be a warning to everyone who is ever in the position to make the same mistake that I did. I live just outside of a rural town in Vermont. It's a tight-knit community where everyone knows one another, and people don't lock their doors at night. There was never really any need to. A little over a year ago, I woke up because I heard a loud banging on my front door. At the time, my husband and I lived in a small home on a dirt road, just off the rural route into town. It was the middle of a snowstorm and the nearby hills can get very slippery in the snow, so I thought that someone might have been in an accident and broken down. It's happened before. When I looked out the window, I could see that our motion spotlight was on. I could see that there were footprints in the snow that had come from our road and into our driveway, but there was no car anywhere. The snow was still covering the road, and no one had driven on it for at least a couple of hours. Our front door was obscured from the window, but I could see that someone was standing out there. I wasn't sure what to think, so I woke my husband up just to feel safer. While I was telling him what was going on, the banging on the door started again and my husband went to answer it while I stood in the hallway. When he opened the door, there were two children standing in the snow, looking toward the ground. There were a boy and a girl, and could not have been more than eight years old. They were dressed strangely and had odd haircuts. The girl's hair was very long, straight, and the boy had a dated haircut that almost looked like a bowl cut. They weren't dressed for a winter, and my first thought was that they must have been Mennonite children, but as far as I know... There was never a large community of Mennonites near us. Thinking back on it, I know that my normal reaction to seeing children in a snowstorm would have been to rush them inside and bundle them up with some blankets and hot cocoa. But that's not how this felt. The children were very unnerving. They would not make eye contact. And when my husband asked them if everything was okay, they asked if they could come in. 
My husband looked at me like, what do I do? And I asked the kids where their parents were. They'll be here soon, is all they said. It was around two o'clock in the morning at this point, and so the only reasonable thought in my head was that there must have been an accident or these kids got lost. As much as my instincts told me not to bring them inside, I did it anyway. I went into the kitchen to make them some hot cocoa, while my husband took them into the living room. While I was fixing the kettle, I could hear my husband talking to the kids. He was asking them if they were okay, where they came from, how far they walked, if their parents' car was broken down, things like that. But they always answered, our parents will be here soon. They spoke in a sing-songy voice. They weren't afraid to be in a stranger's home at all. I started to notice that our cats, we had four, were all hiding except Pigeon, who was in the kitchen with me. Normally, our cats are very curious and friendly, and we have to be careful that they don't run out the door when we leave. This time, none of them even tried to see who was here, which I thought was very strange. All of the hair on Pigeon's neck was standing up, and his tail was puffed up while he looked into the living room. When I bent down to pet him and see what was wrong, he hissed and started growling and backed up until he had hid himself under the kitchen island. I have never seen him do that before. When I walked back into the living room, the kids were sitting on the couch as still as can be, but my husband was holding his head in his hands. I asked him what was wrong, and he just said that he felt very dizzy all of a sudden, but he was fine. I turned back to the children to give them their cocoa, but when they looked at me, I gasped. It took everything inside of me not to drop the mugs and run away. When they looked at me, their eyes were completely black. They had no whites, just giant black pupils. When they saw that I was scared, they stood up and asked if they could use the bathroom. I tried to be as composed as I could be and showed them down the hall. They went into the bathroom together, and I hurried back to my husband to ask him if he had seen their eyes. He had seen them too and said that it looked like his brother's badly bruised eyes after a car accident. We were in the middle of talking about whose children they could be when my husband's nose started to bleed. He'd never had nosebleeds as long as I had known him. I just knew inside myself that this had something to do with the kids in the bathroom, and I started to cry while I ran to get my husband some tissues. That's when the power went out. I heard my husband yell my name from the living room, and as I started to walk back through the hallway, I stopped dead in my tracks. The two children were standing at the end of the hallway. They weren't moving, and I've never been so scared in my whole life. They just stood there in the dark. After what felt like forever, the boy said, Our parents are here. And they walked to the door, opened it, and walked out, leaving it wide open. My husband jumped up to go close it and almost fell over. We looked out the window and saw two men standing by a black car, idling at the end of our driveway. The men looked like they were wearing black-colored suits and were very tall, at least six feet. When my husband waved at them, they just stared at us, got into the car, and drove off. Our power came on about a half an hour later, but nothing was the same after that. Over the next few months, three of our cats went missing. We can only assume that they ran away somewhere and never came back, but the worst thing was coming home to find Pigeon in a puddle of blood on the living room floor. He looked like he had been vomiting blood. The vet told us that he had some kind of hemorrhage. After my husband's nosebleeds became a regular occurrence, we went to see a doctor. He didn't know what to make of it other than dry nasal passages. But my husband was diagnosed with an aggressive skin cancer. When the doctor asked us if he used tanning beds, we both thought he was joking. But apparently this kind of melanoma is linked to overuse of indoor tanning. The doctors think he will recover, but don't understand how he got it so bad so quickly. My husband has never worked an outdoor job and spends relatively little time in the sun. Since we let the black-eyed kids inside our home, I've also suffered from regular dizzy spells and nosebleeds on a regular basis. I've had other issues which I won't mention here, but trust me when I say that I'm suddenly in the worst condition of my life and no one could do anything about it. I know that all of this is because I let the black-eyed children into my home. We've told everyone we could about the strange kids that showed up that night, but no one else saw them, and some laugh at how scared we were of the Mennonite kids, but we know what we saw. I wish my husband had never 
open the door. Feel free to publish this as a warning to others about the black-eyed kids. My advice would be to lock your doors, call the police, and wait for morning. Don't make the same mistake that I did. Oh man, is that the end? Yeah, Where are that's we at? The end. Do we start now? We start. <laughs> Who are you? Where officially? are you? We are on. <laughs> We are on. <laughs> after our... Hello, Jennifer, my our, sister. After our newfangled, elongated <coughs> intro. <clears throat> Ew. Uh, is that is that long intro? Let me post it here that way because we're going live different places. That way people can see all the comments. Guys, uh, we're going live different... Is it going to post? Okay, it just had a hiccup. Ew. So if you're not seeing all the comments, click on... I just posted the link for StreamYard. Click on it. It should be a one-time thing. Give permission and... You should see all the comments pop up like magic. <laughs> no, it just technology is how it works. Like, <laughs> so I said it's magic. Some programmer actually thought this out. Swear and actually to God, put I'll the come over this desk. I'll come over this desk to probably program how this is working. I've already now. threatened him once this morning because oh. he questioned me. And oh. Oh, no, you didn't question me. You called me fat. I did not call you fat. And I did not call you fat. You opted for the Big Mac value meal, to which I suggested probably you should think about that. And you said, why? And I said, because it's not going to help your figure. Now, I never alluded alluded to her starting figure, but it's not going to help it wherever it is. I have a medication issue, okay? (laughs) No, it's true. Don't laugh. Because this medicine makes me... It causes joint pain and it makes you gain weight but you want to help so i'm like unless you want to see 183 pounds coming at you in a blaze of fury buddy you will shut your lip do you know what helps that a slowed of mac sauce helps (laughs) it does (laughs) (laughs) oh trista go if you click on it it uh go at the top of the page over to the left and i think well you're on mobile Search for it. You'll find it. (laughs) How helpful of you. She's like, thanks. (laughs) Uh, First off, we already had kind of addressed this in the narrative, which you people won't hear until Tuesday. You got to listen to it. It's a really good script. But we did start off the the introduction for the script this week as uh, kind of explaining our two-week hiatus there. Uh, Week one of the hiatus, I uh, had the script mostly done. This was actually kind of an in-depth script. I could have went much longer with it, and my nagging OCD just begged me to go longer with it, and I didn't want to oversaturate it. I know that a lot of podcasts have done this subject before, being the Black Eyed Kids, which you could see up top. If this is purely audio, you read the title, I assume, before you uh, started listening to the episode. Uh, But we we could just span this out to like 10 episodes if we really wanted to because there's so much information, so many stories and such about the Black Eyed Kids. That we needed to rein it in. I needed to rein it in. So by the time I actually finished the script for it, um, it was just a hair too late. Um, She had been working all morning, so she was definitely pooped. And uh, the way that we record now, with especially the band practice that I have, uh, we do the band practice on Saturday, which doesn't make me available for recording this until Sunday. Unfortunately, I work early Monday mornings, and sometimes it's hard to be able to record and then edit and then have the release on Tuesday. So if we're late sometimes, it's usually because of the scheduling conflict between when we record on the weekends and then when I get the time to edit uh, during the week before it releases. Week two, which was Mother's Day weekend, you had a little bit of a surprise. Uh, Do you want to quickly tell them about that? Yeah. We had kittens. (laughs) No, we had this stray cat that was kind of hanging out around our house she's been here for like months and she even tried climbing she she like climbed up our house and tried climbing in the window like she was determined and so i don't i don't even know but we knew she was pregnant and uh you know we couldn't leave with that little cold snap we had (coughs) excuse me we could we didn't want to leave her out in that you know with kittens so we brought her in and lo and behold a day it was that next day that night Uh, We went to bed, and she climbed in bed with us. Oh, cool. She's going to sleep with us. How cute. And uh, we woke up at 4 a.m. to... She had already popped out two kittens right there in bed with us. So that was a good time. No, it was. It was awesome. It was awesome. But since you were up so early... Oh, yeah. We were like... That first couple days was just like crazy. Yep. I made it over. I think we had lunch, and you're like, man, it just... It's got to be nap time. 
Yeah, because we, we didn't have any yeah. sleep. Like we didn't go to bed till like two, two thirty, and then she yeah. was, "Hey, let's yeah. have babies at four. <laughs> but uh, all are healthy. They didn't. She didn't lose any. Yeah. So they're all behind me back there. They have a little corner in the uh, walk-in closet. So they actually have the whole closet, kind of, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. She's still trying to pick them up and take them. Well, yeah, that's what we got up this morning, and my husband was taking the dogs out, and like first thing, I go in check on the babies. Our little kitty nuggets, as I refer to them. And there's only one. We, she had four. And there's one in the box. And I'm like, ah! So I ran outside. You can picture that. Me and my nightgown running outside. Uh, and I'm like, we have, there's only one kitten in the box. And he's like, ah, oh, shit. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then, so we're searching all through the house. Where are these kittens? Because you we can't hear them meowing or anything. And they're a, a week and a day old now at this point. So... You know, if you're on my personal friends here on Facebook, uh, you know that we're going through remodeling in our house. So, of course, where does she hide them? She hides them behind the 15 sheets of drywall <laughs> in the living room. Yeah. So guess who was moving drywall this morning? Yeah. Yeah. But they're back. Wasn't in me. Spot. It was Daryl. I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. They're back in their spot now. Yes. And so we, we are recording today. Yeah. So we're back. So thank you for bearing, bearing with us in our in our sometimes haphazard schedule. Uh, we are back today, and I think I ugh, lost my train of thought. Uh, but today we will be talking about the Black Eyed Kids. I love this. I love this topic. I know. On, I'm so weird. I we've just... been planning on this for a while. Uh, we have a running list of topics that we do, and sometimes we schedule a few episodes ahead uh sometimes we just go in and kind of just cherry pick the ones that we feel like researching for the week and that's kind of what becomes What's the my show mood? that's what that's what becomes the show uh i've actively put off this one like i said it's such a big topic and it's kind of formidable for me in, in my head when writing and researching about it and like i said a bunch of other podcasts have done that i did not wear it today but last weekend I had a series oh, yeah. of I had a series of road trips. Uh, my shirt that I had ordered from T Public for the Kryptonite podcast had come in, and if you guys have been with us any any amount of time, whether it be on the lives or on the audio side, uh, you hear me talk about co- podcasts all the time. Uh, and I've urged you to get on listening to the Kryptonite podcast. I also further urge you to get on their T Public store. Uh, if you don't know what T Public is, essentially it's an online uh, T shirt. Pro- producing company that you don't have to buy bulk t-shirts uh of whatever to have them on hand in order to stock them you just send them like templates for your design uh, i hope that i explained this right because this is the way i understand it you send them templates for your design on your t-shirt and then whenever someone wants it they put in an order and then t public will make that yeah. one shirt for that one person you don't you don't have the overhead you don't have the stock and then whoever has the account will get like a, a cut of it uh, from each sale which is pretty cool yep and in whatever color you want your whatever you're getting your t-shirt well, whatever it, in it right it kind of depends it kind of depends on how the the different options they provide i'm kind of really particular on my shirts i don't wear 100 percent cotton especially the heavy cotton because yeah. i get too hot and i get sweaty and i don't like it i throw the shirt away so i usually go for the bi blend or the tri blend and uh, i was looking through they had a sale on uh it said uh that it's an inside joke for their podcast it said heller space kryptonaut podcast in the form of black sabbath's master of reality cover and it was on sale i was like oh crap i'm gonna get on that well uh i couldn't at the time like just it, it's not expensive for the t-shirt Shipping is expensive. Like, that's the way it is across the board right now. And I was paying just about as much for shipping as I was for the t-shirt. And I really wanted to support them. Yeah, it's terrible. And I really wanted to support them, but it's like shipping, man. Like, I can understand Public and stuff, but shipping is outrageous. So I looked down the list, and they had another one that they actually have goals for. I'm going to assume you could set goals for certain types of shirts that you put on or certain designs. I don't know if it helps you anymore. Maybe you, maybe they get a bigger cut, so that's how they decipher a deal. But I end up settling for one of those. I spent a little bit more than I want to. I know uh, my irony in itself of me wondering if I wanted the first one. But it finally came in, and I wore it a couple times, tagged them in the post. Uh, they seemed pretty excited because I know I was excited. I was going to wear it last week, but we ended up not recording. Um, and so this morning, I just threw everything together. I didn't wear it. So I will wear it next week. Uh, again, uh, I like to plug in as much as I can because it's a fantastic podcast. I think it's like consistently ranked like no, no, 
one the top top five oh, is of it? this kind of podcast across all platforms. Awesome. So if you haven't listened to it, check it out. Kryptonite Podcast with Rob, Chris, and Mark. Give them a listen. Check it out because I'm almost caught up with all of them, and I have no life at the, work I, sometimes. Uh, I think so. it's stressed us. Says uh, sounds like your sounds like Alex is talking through his webcam instead of his mic. Really? Like this? Is this better? Do I need turned up? That's right. I'm going to keep talking. Tell me if I, if, if I need turned up. I think I have my mic muted. It says on my screen, mic muted. So huh. if I need turned up, let me know. I'm going to keep going. And then uh, if you can, uh, on the interface. Yeah, that's what I was just looking yeah. over there to check. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. We're not peeking out, right? Uh, no, no. Trista says Alex keeps freezing up in, his, in slow motion. Yeah, hopefully next week that'll be remedied. Uh, yep, we're going we'll to try We should have the new computer and new computer the new system. webcam. Yep. Hi, Andrea Imes. Thanks for joining us, lovely. Yep. That's gonna happen. All right, so let's care. Let's get let's get into this. Enough of the, enough of the shout outs and all that crap for now. Um, says I'm sound like I'm talking to a tin can. <coughs> I don't know. Try turning me up a hair. We'll see if that works. It's weird. It should my mic my my tablet says your mic is muted. I don't okay, think it's the it tablet mic. From here. Ah, weird. Okay. Checking everything over. Okay, just a little bit. Checking it. Checking the mic. On the fly, checking it. So anyway, we finally got to the Black Eyed Kids this week. Super excited to do it, but super apprehensive. So let's begin. Do you want me to begin, or do you want to begin? Begin. Am I and beginning? And go. Oh, it's me. She pointed to me. Okay. Action. I'm gonna get me one of them little clickers. Okay. <laughs> okay. Quite on set. Every time PD. <laughs> Or Beebs makes noise. I'm quite on set. All right. Anyway, okay. So we got a Black Eyed Kids today. There are many type of archetypal human fears, okay? Uh, we got spiders, what, snakes, heights, things that, like, we can all, even if we're not in particular, in particular, ugh, in particularly scared of spiders ourselves, <laughs> it is a common human thing, and we can kind of understand how people would be scared of these things. Um the thing we're talking about today, being the Black Eyed Kids, tries to override our natural inclination to want to help and protect children. Because these things are freaky as hell. The There is a term that describes something's cuteness factor, if you will. And I'm going to butcher it because I'm terrible at German. It's a Kinderschema, which would be a term that describes the attributes that endear babies to most people. Attributes including forehead height, a chubby face... And an head to an eye to head proportion, being larger eyes, being typically cuter, and so that's why you see like a lot of cartoons with a lot of bigger, bigger eyeballs. Yeah, right, because it's it's usually cuter, right? Yeah, in a um, sense, cute. And there's but there's a proportion to that eye size to head size, because if we get into like the tip at the atypical gray drawing, that I seems was just eerie, gonna say that. Yeah, it's not just about the big eyes; it's about the the proportions of it. Mm-hmm. So. Um, with that being said, with the eye proportion, the eyes are the most striking characteristic of the black eyed kids. Their eyes are entirely black through and through. There's no discernible pupil, uh, or iris, which you would probably, or you could say the exact opposite. It's all pupil and it's all just black, right? Yeah. It's all you see is black. Yep. No sclera, no white part of the eye. I don't know where we want to begin with this because we kind of backtrack in there. Uh, Okay, so for the origins, we we started out first off by saying that a lot of people, a lot of people shorten the term "black eyed kids" to be EKs, and we probably will do that a lot. Which, by the way, I had to continually fight myself from saying "black eyed kids," which to me kind of sounds like like a nineteen nineties. I was just gonna say boy band, like a, no, like a nineteen nineties movie trying to emulate a nineteen thirties setting of like a vagabond gang of children. That just fight all the time. Just, we're the black eyed kids. We're like, the black eyed kids. You make them sound like the little munchkins. From, we're the black eyed kids. From Munchkin Land yeah, or something. I imagine. With they their, represent with their, the like, lollipop derby, build. With their, derby, <laughs> with their derby hats and their suspenders. Yeah. And like, they got the, the pushed up. The, the lollipop guild. Yeah, <laughs> that was the name of them. Yeah. I guess that's what I'm thinking of. They kind of creeped me guild. out though when I was little. I'm like, oh, that's not right. <laughs> That little oh, one, that little one with the with the handlebar mustache. Ooh. <laughs> and it's like a grimace, but it's not a I grimace. Know. Uh, anyway, so the uh, the the origins of the Black Eyed Kids can closely be related to uh, creepy pastas being circulated on the internet. If you don't know what creepy pastas are, and I I think there was another podcast I can't remember which one it was that actually went into the origins of the term creepy pasta, but essentially it comes from the copy and paste of the old AOL days. So if y'all don't remember AOL, um, 
it was it was the internet where you actually had to dial up, right? So you would get on the internet and it would take place with your phone line and it would be like calling through your phone line Here. as opposed to that yeah. annoying. Oh my god. Connecting, connecting, denied. <sighs> yeah, and it would drop. Or you'd be on the internet searching on what you would look for, your freaking Angel Fire websites, and then all of a sudden, like, you would hear the phone ring, and you're like, oh, well, there man, goes that download. Got kicked off. All right. So, but that's so where much we started. for my Napster download. <laughs> yeah. <I know. laughs> Not that we were all doing that. Been downloading this song for two days and I you know. ruined it. Put I put it, I put it on before I went to bed. It was oh, almost done. Oh man, it was terrible. So uh, if you got an email back then, you you would start to see these chain letters, and we still have them. We still have these chain letters today. Just oh, a lot yeah. of them have, like trans transferred to memes or whatever. But you would have these long things, and you, what are the big ones? Like you remember the scam ones where people were like, "I'm a Nigerian <laughs> prince, prince," and blah blah. blah. Uh, but this wasn't exactly like that. It would be like a story someone was trying to tell you, and a lot of times it'd be like a warning. Like what was yeah. the one with like I I remember one with um. It was an urban legend, but I remember this one's distinctly being a copy and paste story of like the uh, the roaches, the roach eggs and Taco Bell stuff. Oh yeah, I forgot about that one. Yeah, there's something with Taco Taco Bell stuff having roach eggs in them mm-hmm. or something. Then you'd eat them; they would grow inside your cheeks or something. Well, they kind of do the same thing now, but they you get them through Messenger. Through Facebook Messenger, yeah, like okay, you're forever yeah. getting those. Yeah, so that that's that's the kind of thing we're where we're talking about where the, where the black eyed kids popularity really popularity really got started with these copy and paste things and the and the term eventually spread to creepypasta now the thing we want to mention about the creepypastas and especially nowadays it's not so much in emails like you said maybe the the facebook messenger messages uh would have them uh but also reddit is a big thing now now the big difference between a lot of these older copy and paste stories that you would get from you know emails and stuff such uh did i just see something from kimbo yeah, Kimbo said, "Hey, hey, Kimbo. Um, one of the one of the big differences between the, the the old copy and paste stories that you would get your email and the Reddit nowadays is uh, a lot of the Reddit forums. Uh, if you don't know what Reddit is, because I don't do Reddit a lot, it's, I don't. it's just a series of of what's called subreddits, and you can make like anything into a subreddit. It, like we could have a group called the Supernatural Tendencies Group subreddit, where like it would be essentially like like an internet forum just for us within Reddit. So." A lot of these stories started coming into Reddit, and and it could be about anything. And the problem with that is, is like especially with Reddit, like you don't need to cite anything. A lot of these things are just for fun. So you they would write stories, and they would be like writing practice, and that's that's the hardest part about researching these black eyed kids stories is trying to decipher whether or not this story is an actual verified account that someone's trying to share, mm-hmm. or if it's just essentially writing practice yeah for story someone, someone made up just trying just trying to scare you just trying to have yeah. fun and practice their writing skills and that's essentially what it is nine times out of ten it's not even really malicious i mean really there's a term called shit posting nowadays and if you don't know what shit posting is it's just you're doing stuff to piss people off that's all you're doing yeah right it just to stir up debate i think i lost my feed uh that's essentially what it could be if even if not a lot malicious it's just something to do for fun so i think we i think i've dropped both feeds for me Hold on, let me... Oh, nope, it's loading. Okay, it says having trouble connecting. Can everybody still hear us and see us? Let me there know. There it goes. I just want to make sure. I'm Hopefully. still not on. Oh, on our, on okay. my end, it's... Right. On my end, it's booping. I got my patented Sam's Cola. Try not to string the audio listeners along too much. Uh, I think we're back up now. So, like I said, that's the hardest part about researching for this, is trying to decipher the legitimate accounts uh, it, it, between those and... and our reddit shit posting <laughs> which is essentially what it is yeah so if we're gonna go back to an originating story um and we're gonna we're gonna come back to the the ancient stories the antiquities but for now we're trying to keep to the uh the actual label the term black eyed kids and the first time we really see this black eyed kids term would be in 1996 not too long ago and this is now a famous story. If you've ever heard a story about Black Eyed Kids, you're going to hear Brian Bethel's story yeah. about the Black Eyed Kids. This is kind of the originating story with a lot of these moving forward. Brian Bethel was a journalist in Abilene, Texas, um, just like anybody else would be during this mm-hmm. day of his encounter. Uh, he'd be riding a check in his car. I believe he was cat corner to, I don't know if it was like a, the bank or whoever he was riding the yeah, check yeah. to. Uh, later, in, <clears throat> later in the evening... And he would be so engrossed with writing his check, he wouldn't see 
two kids approach the driver's side of his car. He also wouldn't notice them until they knocked on the window. And he instinctively snapped out of what he was doing yeah. and then rolled down the window. Yeah, so this is nighttime. I didn't, I didn't I wasn't sure if you added that. It's it's near. I, I, I pictured it as dusk. I don't think I didn't yeah. think it was quite night. Yeah, yeah. I think it was like eight o'clock at night or something like that. But you it know, was where it's close enough to the final e- movie starting times, so and that yeah. would be a point to come why that's yeah. important. Um so when he rolls the window down, an instant wave of fear would just come over him when seeing these children. He would peg him at like did, did, did we give an exact one? I don't think I put that. Peg him between uh, like 9 and 13-ish. Mm-hmm. Um, that may not be right. I, for some reason, I'm an idiot and I didn't actually note that in, in the script. So that's not even going to be in there either. Uh, so not not exactly y- old enough to be coming up and asking for a ride, but not young enough for it to be odd that this age group would be out doing yeah what they're going to be doing i keep like alluding to something and it's not they want to go see a movie (laughs) yeah i keep like stringing it along (laughs) they tell them that they want to go see a movie um but they forgot their money so their age group doesn't it doesn't set off alarms in that they're like they're not too young to be out or anything like that this would be an age group who could feasibly have forgotten their money uh who feasibly could need a ride home to grab their money and all they want is a ride home so that they can grab their money to come back and see the movie the problem is, is Bethel cannot shake this wave of fear that's come over him with these children. The kids would go on to say that we're just two kids and we don't have any guns. So he finds that weird as anybody reading the story would. Yeah. For one, why do you need an assertion that we're just two kids? Yeah, it's like they're trying to push the fact that we're harmless. Yes, exactly. You know? Yeah, trying to, trying, to, trying to fish you a little bit. We're just two kids. What should you have to worry about? We don't have any guns. But, of course, one wouldn't expect children of that age to have guns. So it seems like a deliberate tell. Well, and it almost feels like these kids are expecting you to be afraid of them. Yeah. What normal little kid like that is going to be expecting a grown man to be fearful of them? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. So... Bethel eventually would break his eye contact and just look away. And this is very important that he breaks eye contact because after he breaks eye contact, he now realizes that he feels compelled to stay engaged with the conversation, especially with eye contact. And now his eye contact is broken. And if it couldn't get any worse, he now feels another harder, harsher wave of fear come over him. So he starts thinking to himself... And then he says it out loud to the kids that, hey, even if I take you home right now, by the time we got to wherever you live, even if it's close, mm-hmm. by the time we got back, your movie is going to be the majority of the way over. And as he ends the sentence and starts to turn back to him, now he realizes that both kids' eyes are completely blacked out. Yeah. He didn't notice that before. And with many of these cases where someone said they had experienced something like this, and always keep in mind, just always keep in mind, like I keep saying, from the start... With a lot of these stories, whether they're creepypastas or not, it's hard to decipher whether they're real or not, but this seems to be the reoccurring theme, whether or not it's a made-up story or whether it's purported to be a true story, that the first thing that people notice when encountering them isn't their eyes. It's the overwhelming fear, the Mm -hmm. uneasiness that for no reason why they should have this toward toward these children. It's not until... Sometime later, and usually after breaking this eye contact and then coming back to eye contact, do the people who encounter these these children or see these all black eyes. So that's another interesting one. So now the kids are starting to get agitated. So so Bethel looks back and sees their all black eyes. I'm going to assume he reacts like, <gasps> or something, <Yeah>. right? <laughs> Whatever it is, the kids start to get agitated and the older of the of the two uh, starts to tell him that we need a ride, but we can't get in the car unless you invite us. Mm-hmm. And it wouldn't be long after this that Bethel put the pedal to the metal and got out of there. Hightail it, <laughs> hightail it out of Dodge. OK, now of many of the podcasts that I listen to, that is a reoccurring story being told. That's the end of that story. That's 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 the first story by Brian Bethel in Abilene, Texas mm-hmm. in 1996. What a lot of podcasts, what I don't hear from a lot of podcasts is the follow up, the background of Mr. Brian Bethel. Brian Bethel fervently says that what he says in this story is true. He didn't, he didn't make anything up. He didn't, he didn't embellish anything. This is what happened. The interesting fact 
also about Mr. Bethel is that he was like a proto blogger. I say that because it wasn't a term at the time. Mm-hmm. He, I think he was a physical journalist, as in he, he he also wrote for a paper in Abilene, but then he also did one of the early internet blogs as well, which then I know what it was called. I, never, I didn't even really hear the term blog until what mid 2000s probably maybe? yeah and it was probably i give myself that the uh the time where like you're not in the know so it's probably we'll call it like 2000 2005 we'll say right and that's not spot on but he was a proto blogger the interesting more interesting part of that story is the fact that that same day on his blog let me see where i put it here alt dot magic mr bethel would also write another story Uh, having to do with the Bloody Mary urban legend. He says, quote, do you want to read it? Let me read it. Oh, good. I don't have mine up. Okay. Uh, He posted, we we took this little excerpt if you want to look at it. Uh, I'm not sure if you can actually find it at alt.magic, but you can find this in referencing Brian Bethel, alt.magic, Bloody Mary. So if you want to look it up, there's my citation. He wrote that same day. Then I thought to myself, what a situation ripe for spontaneous expression of magic. The will, in this case, is the belief, especially among those who were brave slash foolish enough to try the ritual itself. The method by which the necessary reality shift would be accomplished is the fear of the story and the imagined entity produced. So can we create something like Mary just by collective force of will? If not just childhood legends, why not gods and goddesses as well? Are they all just expressions of enough collective reality shifts? Or can they somehow exist on their own? Now, I find this very interesting. Because what he is uh, talking about here is the idea of a tulpa. I believe we've alluded to tulpas many instances mm-hmm. across multiple episodes that we've done but we've never had the chance to really go into what a tulpa is i think it's very important with this story that it, it could closely be related to what tulpas are now i think we may have to take this really slow and we try to take it really slow in the script as as in explaining it because it's kind of a complex spiritual theory and if you're not familiar with what a tulpa is i think you could get lost really easy so we'll start off with the technicality of a tulpa. It originated from a Tibetan concept called a sprolpa, meaning emanation or manifestation. Um, let me go through. I don't want to read our script word for word. But essentially what a tulpa is, is a spiritual mental manifestation of an entity. And this entity, for all intents and purposes, becomes real for you. And you could manifest one with any purpose that you want, you can manifest it for guidance, for protection, uh, for anything. In fact, an- by anything, I mean you can use it uh, maliciously. You can oh, yeah, create to go after someone. Just like it, maybe a like, common like voodoo concept yeah. of like the doll or something like that. You can create a tulpa for any purpose. Now, with that being said, with the furthermore caveat, I don't know if that's a phrase, but I'm making it to to further that caveat. Not only can you make one for for malicious intent. If you provide this topa, this mental spiritual image that you feed energy to that can physically become manifest, like this can of pop growing legs and walking away, you can also feed it so much energy over so long that it could become sentient and do things on its own will with its own intentions. De- yeah, de- de- developing its own thinking, mm-hmm. thought process. You know, and, and I talk about this. Those of you guys who follow my page and what I do, you know, I talk about this all the time. When you hold feelings, you know, just an example here, uh, because, you know, uh, he's talking about how you consciously, like you set your intentions on, I'm going to manifest this. I'm going to bring it into existence. Don't go too far because we got the example. Yeah, yeah. But I just want to say that, you know, in my work, too, I'm always talking about how unconsciously. Mm -hmm. These things can be created when you hold any type of negative feeling or emotion, you know, anger, fear, depression, anything like that. And and I'm talking like years of, you know, constantly or near, you know, all the time mm-hmm. being in these feelings, you can you can un- unconsciously create this physical energy and it can get so strong that it will disconnect from you and then just kind of go on its little happy hunting way Mm -hmm. so you know again it's 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 the same line of 
how these things come about or possibly come about. Yep. And the scariest part about when it detaches itself and <coughs> starts to have its own agenda yeah. is that there's there's no real recognizable set of morality or ethics no. to it. Um, whether or not you're religious or not, whether you, you pertain you or you, I don't know how to say this part, uh, whether or not you... You ascribe where you have received your morals and ethics from, whether it be a, a religion, religious book yeah. or some awesome do-it-yourself guide, whatever it is, you've gained your morals and ethics and it's been applied to your to your soul, to your humanity. If something that doesn't have humanity creates something on its own. Own. No empathy, no feeling. It, it does things just because it wants to do things with no thought of the repercussions yes. of it because it's not affected. And even if it is affected, it gets dispersed and there's not necessarily an afterlife that it's had to contemplate or any any real repercussions that it needs to worry about because it is just a f- pure energy that now has formulated its own thought. That's very confusing. So let's put it in a way that you may understand a little bit better because... Well, kind of even further, it's now a an, a physical energy on its own who now has to feed. However you want to look at that. Okay, yeah. Because any, all, any and all types of energy, they require more energy to keep going. Yeah. You know, you, you know what I mean by that? Yep. Yeah. Nope, so, now, so now you've got this ball of negative, let's say negative energy, anger, depression, fear – just kind of floating around, and it's hungry looking for a food source. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. not a good situation. Yep. So that's what we're talking about. And you could go with the, the we could stop at the purely spiritual energy um, idea that, that she's kind of speaking of, but it goes to the umph degree that it could physically manifest as in a walking, talking thing. Yeah. That you could see, and that could hurt you, and that could touch you. Like, that's the point. So to to illustrate the idea... While there may not be a literal man in a red suit that comes around to to many Western homes every Christmas Eve to hand out presents under the tree, even with the sheer fact that so many people, even children, especially children, even some adults who like help feed the belief in Santa Claus could, in theory, literally manifest a Santa Claus. Wasn't there a movie done about that? I know there was. I can't think of what it was, though. numerous ones. Where, um... They went around, uh, if, the, if the kids of the world, if all the kids of the world didn't believe in Santa Claus, then he would disappear. Isn't that Santa Claus with Tim Allen? Maybe it was. I don't remember. Don't their belief, like, they made the energy go down? I didn't think it was Tim Allen. I don't think it was Tim Allen. I think it was, uh, I remember it had little Jack Frost. Yeah. I don't know. It's one of those movies Either Turtle way. made me watch. Either way. So, in theory, Santa Claus could physically manifest, and there could be a real Santa Claus just from... The mass amount of people who believe in mm-hmm. this figure that most likely at one point, at least the way we perceive him today, was purely imaginary. Yeah. Um, one step further could be another example of what would be like Slender Man. I mean, there's – and we won't go too far into it because that would be technically a whole new episode. But uh, even if Slender Man – was not real before all the stories started to circulate with so many people – Possibly believing that there is a real Slender Man, that belief could manifest a physical, real Slender Man afterwards, Mm -hmm. which is the point, which is why I want to explain that, because this could be the point with these black eyed kids. Even though we do have stories from antiquity of solid colored eyed figures, black eyed kids in, in particular are kind, I want to say sparse because there, there are there, but in this particular setting, are, are kind of few and far between. But once Brian Bethel wrote about this on in 1996... Then the floodgates were open. And then numerous reports started coming out and coming out and coming out. And again, whether or not they're real or just a bunch of creepypastas, the, the idea of the creepypasta is to make you believe it's real, to make you feel the emotion of the writer. Mm-hmm. If you read a love story, the writer wants you to understand the love. In this case, the writer wants you to be scared. So whether or not this is real or not, if you believe in these black-eyed kids as being real, we could all unintentionally feed into a collective idea that could manifest and become real. So that was the point of this first part first part 
of an explanation. And so we're kind of jumping the gun with kind of seeing what's kind of, you know, going over what theories we have. But that was kind of the first one that kind of jumps up that I haven't heard many podcasts really talk about in 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 depth yeah and it's really telling that brian bethel that same day as he reported the black eyed kids talked about the idea of the urban legend of bloody mary and is there the possibility that if so many people believed in bloody mary that we could bring bloody mary to life Mm -hmm. and he's talking about this top idea so it's an interesting little thing that people don't bring up a whole lot that even though brian bethel says i'm being truthful this is what happened i swear to you he also wrote this other thing to try to make it sound like, well, what, let's try an experiment. Let's try some stuff. Yeah. So, where we move on from there? I have no idea where we move on from there. So that, was <laughs> <in depth. laughs> that was an in-depth thing. Uh, some other reoccurring things that people seem to find... I'm sorry, i got to adjust. This chair is terrible. Uh, the, so, some of the other things that we seem to find beyond this initial, initial study of the Black Eyed Kids with the Bethel Report... Uh, after the floodgates open, like, like she had said, and we start to get more and more reports, we start to have more and more varying reports. Uh, we get different skin colors, sometimes tinted blue, sometimes tinted green. Um, sometimes it's a pair of boys, sometimes it's a boy and a girl, but usually within the ages specified, we'll, we'll call it what, eight to 16 ish. Yeah. Kind of, kind of varying. Uh, most of them try not to make eye contact on first glance, which could lead one to believe that that's why they're not noticed at first but a lot of these are in close proximity so you'd probably know it but the but the striking one is of course the uh is the is the is the fear that you fear feel feel that you fear (laughs) i'm gonna stop get it together um what do we got next i have no idea oh here we go now we get into the the examples in history that we found of black eyed kids uh, do you still not have it up? Or are you just listening to me? No, I don't. I, I don't have it up. But okay. I, I was just going to say that you know a lot of people think, oh, it started in '96. There mm-hmm. were no 1996 with this guy's story. Yeah. There were no, you know, in history there haven't been any other accounts of these black eyed kids. Well, that's not true. No, in fact, if any of you uh, again, and I keep I, I do this all the time, and I don't care because I'm going to plug good content when we find good content. Yeah. If you've ever heard of Jim Harold, he has JimHarold.com. Love Jim I Harold. I think he has different podcasts too because yes. I think for sure he's got Jim Harold. Uh, was it like around the campfire? Or yeah, campfire, or campfire story, something like that. And I think he has a couple more, so I'm not sure if this if it stemmed from his radio because I think he was on the radio for a pretty long time. But if you want anything paranormal too, Jim Harold is like is the gold standard for paranormal mm-hmm. stuff, especially podcast so check that out but i did find an article written on jimherald.com by ryan sprague article written in 2015 who actually references a book written by david weatherly now david weatherly let me find the name of his book i think it's just called the black the black eyed kids the black eyed kids yeah. by weatherly wanted to find a history of this so again like i said uh this was done kind of after Bethel's Bethel's stuff happened. So now we're trying to find, you know, pre Bethel things happening. Um, Weatherly does a great job. I didn't actively read it myself, but this is all in the Sprog Sprog article mm. that you can find. Yeah. Uh, so I I'm I'm gonna cite that for you. Try the Sprog on Jim Harold, and then also get that book if you can because it sounds fantastic. Of uh, of stories spanning from ancient China to Gobekli Tepe, and that's what we go into next. So first off, is gonna be the belief in ancient China. That these type of demon children come about from children who have died prematurely, especially in natural disasters. Whenever a natural disaster would come through, be it a tsunami, hurricane, whatever, that would take the life of children, these these kids would come back trying to exact vengeance. Uh, Within a modern context, why they would be doing that or to what end is still kind of unclear, Mm -hmm. but that was just kind of the folk teaching. We then move on to Gobekli Tepe, which is possibly one of the oldest holy sites in the world. And they've also found another solid-eyed entity carving there called the Urfa Man. I have not heard about this until I started oh, yeah. doing doing this research, right? The Urfa Man carved more than 13,500 years ago. Still stands, and I think they've uprooted it. I think they took it to a museum or something. Mm-hmm. It's not in its original setting anymore. Uh, is almost six feet tall, and it's the oldest naturalistic sized human carving uh it was unearthed in 1993 in southeastern turkey he dons a v-shaped crest across his chest and he's holding his hands like across his pelvis Mm -hmm. but the most fantastic feature would be his eyes his eyes are carved out and inset with 
two carved obsidian marbles. Mm -hmm. Um, And people say upon looking at it... Oh, Ember says hi. I was just going to pop that up there. (laughs) Uh, Two two carved obsidian marbles are placed in in the sockets of the eyes. And a lot of people... I shouldn't say a lot because we don't know how much. But people have said that upon looking at it, uh, they feel uneasy. It's gross feeling. Now, whether or not... It's, it is clearly just an archetype, a scary thing to have a monocolored eye thing looking at you, or if there is some connection between the black-eyed kids of today and then an entity or entities that people may have experienced mm-hmm. as far back as Gobekli Tepe is still kind of unclear. Um, but I found that really crazy. If you, look, if you look up pictures of the Urfa Man, you can find them really easy. They have yeah. multiple, multiple pictures. You can look at different angles. Coming a little bit further in time... We find um, Michael, how'd you say it? Vassay? Vassy? Vassy. B- Michael Vassy, writing uh, about the Iroquois Indians in his book, Your Haunted Lives, The Black Eyed Kids. Oh, G. Michael Vassy, I'm sorry. Uh, and he has uh, this quote. I'm going to read this quote to you. Mm-hmm. I believe this is from Your Haunted Lives, Black Eyed Kids. The Iroquois Indians believed in a dark power called the Atkin that could take over children and an evil one would make would mate with human females to produce black-eyed, chalky-skinned children. These children were killed by the tribe soon after birth and burned to stop them from resurrecting. Children wandered around al- wandered alone in the woods could also have been taken over by Atkin and would reemerge with black eyes and pale skin, acting nervously while repeating rep- repeating themselves over and over. Their goal was to destroy the tribe and infect all of the people with Atkin. So now we, we're having this more robust story. <laughs> I mean, well, with the, like I said, with a lot of these stories, most people don't let them in, whether it be their car or their house. They don't let them in because they don't feel really good vibes from them. Yeah. And then they notice the, the scary eyes. So now the Iroquois Indians had this idea of the Atkin, which is this evil force, taking over children or impregnating women to have like these demonic children that do have an agenda. Their agenda is to infect the tribe and to infect everybody with Atkin, which is sounding more and more like a virus Mm -hmm. now. So we don't really have a lot of those. Now, one believer could say that we don't have the stories of what happens after they let people, well, that people let them inside because it doesn't end well. So this is our first glimpse into like, some of the mentality possibly with these entities. So are they demonic? Are they vengeful? Um, geez, your guess is as good as ours by like, now, right? Yeah, you could even question, you know, is there some type of extraterrestrial? Yep. A, a, a other wor- a outer worldly thing going on here? Yep, and let's wait on that one because the one right before, because we're going to have a story kind of connecting that because that's, that's another big theory with extraterrestrials. Mm-hmm. But the one that we, we could talk about before that is the idea of this, uh, and I, I allude to it by saying this, there's got to be some type of invisible, unspoken force that stops them from just coming in, right? Mm-hmm. Just coming through your car window or coming into your house. They need permission, which sounds an awful lot like vampires. Mm-hmm. So uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of podcasts cover the vampire theory. Um, we don't really, we haven't had any sightings where someone's whipped out a mirror. Um, I think I'd seen a meme the other day that that wouldn't work today because of the composition of the mirror. Something with mirrors being backed with, was it silver or something? Oh, back in olden days. Yeah. yeah. But now they don't make mirrors the same. So in yeah. theory, vampires could have reflections today. Yeah. Uh, but regardless... And the, the the interesting part about this this barrier, is that there's not really any any real religious context that a lot of these that a lot of these experiencers put this situation into. So whether or not you're you're completely non-religious or you're absolutely the most religious person in your in your religious sect, nothing is really brought up as to a deity naturally or innately protecting you, in order for you to mess up. To let them in. But that's kind of how it seems. Mm-hmm. There's some natural unspoken law of the world, whether or not it be supernatural or, you know, deity based that says we can't do this can't unless they this. let us. Yeah. And and that's where it is kind of odd. Now, with vampires, I believe there is a little bit of of a religious stance 
right? Because they're they're demonic Little crosses they're not... and so there's a lot of things involved with with vampires that would initially not allow them to come in. You're protected by God, so yeah. with your house being holy because you worship God, they can't enter in unless you give them acceptance. But at the same time, they're holy demonic and they want to come eat you. So why would that be okay? But that seems to be the reoccurring thing with a lot of tales of morality, right? You can do whatever you want, and that's the kind of the test that you're constantly put through through your life, especially with these supernatural folkloric tales, is you'd be perfectly fine if you didn't allow it to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So it just kind of falls into place. So are the Black Eyed Kids vamp vampires of some kind? We don't have stories of anybody being drained of blood afterwards, but mm -hmm. of course, if there were, and if they did a good job of it, you wouldn't know. <laughs> right, though? I mean... Yeah, wouldn't even know. You wouldn't know. <laughs> that, no, that's true. That's true. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> what was, the, was there another one? No. So, uh, we ended. I ended it with uh, a fairly tripping up long sentence for her to have to say in the script. But, it was ungodly. But <laughs> until we have But I someone, handled it with my usual finesse. I don't know if I can say it. It was really long. Here we go. Until the day someone has the opportune moment to throw a handful of garlic at a duo of pushy demon-eyed preteens to see if they fall over themselves like the archetypal 1950s housewife at the <laughs> at the side of a mouse. I thought you were going to say something. No. At the side of a mouse, we'll leave this one open for debate. And I got through it one time. <laughs> it took her like 12. Now, I know it was long, but as I, I was like on my phone, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's good. I got to add it. Oh, yeah, that's good. I got to add it. So, <laughs> hold on. I think I got to sneeze. <laughs> oh, it burned so bad in my sinuses. God. Woo! That one hurt. It's still over this right there. I don't want to. You got it see. together. Come on. <laughs> All right. So, so essentially, that's that's the basic end of a lot of the information that we provide in the script, <clears throat> and we kind of reassert the fact that we could go on 10, 10 episodes with this and provide all the stories that we find and all the stories that you could find. But we're going to leave that up to you. If this is something that you want to research, you will be hard pressed not to find one if you throw a rock on the internet and find the story of the Black Eyed Kids. Uh, so you can sift through it, whatever ones you like, whatever you don't like. But we did want to add in this last story. And this last story, we just go in and we just read straight through because it is a long story. Do we want to read it again or do we want to no. condense it? No. Well, because uh, it is kind of a long I story. I would kind of leave it as a, you're going to have to check out the podcast because, I mean, it is a really long story. And I'm going to leave it to them. All right. Let's I just, would check it out because it's an awesome story. Even I was creeped out. Let's suffice it to say, uh, first off, we're not the first podcast to read this story. I know that Astonishing Legends has read it. So this is not anything new that you can't find already. Yeah. Uh, but it's one of the bigger stories after the Bethel case. I don't know if it's supposed to have been predating that. Uh, it's rough to say from this point of view. I don't think, because by now uh, you can go to the actual website, We Can Work Weird, who was emailed this, this story. Um, it essentially is the only real big story that tells what happens after you, after you let them in. After you let them in. Yeah. So she made she made the decision for you guys that you're not going to hear you it. You got to check here. it out. You got to check it out. But it is an it, it, it is an awesome story. Yeah. Awesome story. Okay. So like I said, with a lot of the variations in the different podcasts that I've talked about this, you'll probably find different stories on each one with a few common stories. So that wraps up our information for the day. So let's quickly recap on what we have talked about on possible theories and let's go into the ones that we haven't talked about. So first we have, uh, well, what do we have? The vengeful spirits of, of dead children, mm -hmm. right? Which a lot of different cultures have repercussions for, yeah. you know, ill-fated children. Uh, we have the vampires. Uh, was there another one? The Tulpa. The Tulpa. That's right. The Tulpas. Whether or not they, they preexisted or not, we have mm -hmm. now made them real by the common belief from these app, told stories so we got uh vampires tulpas and uh what's the first one? Oh, vengeful vengeful child spirits yeah so then you brought up the extraterrestrial angle now we could have read this story and it would have kind of added in into that but it didn't but suffice it to say that it possibly involves men in black mm -hmm. and a lot of these stories too will also add in a silhouetted men in black man in black group of like in the in distance black. that isn't that's ancillary to the story and so a lot of people have brought up maybe this is an extraterrestrial or origin. Now, from there, it's such a broad umbrella when we say extraterrestrial in origin. Mm -hmm. Are we speaking of another species of 
extraterrestrial. We have because what well, we have like 65 million species now that we could talk about. Well, yeah, but that's I mean, you know, again, that's things that we don't know. That's oh, uh, speaking specifically. I mean, like we have greys, we have reptilians, we mm-hmm. got, you know, we got yeah. all, all these different types. This would be another one. But the one of the better ones is that it's an alien human hybrid. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's why they have these all black eyes is because some by by whether or not it's a purely extraterrestrial uh, what do you say, like a run experiment or it's half government funded. If you well, haven't watched X-Files because it's been off the air for however many years besides that little stint that yep, they did. But a lot of the similar there are a lot of similarities are there. You know, you have the dark eyes, you yep. have the, you know, pale, chalky yep. colored skin, a demeanor that seems technically correct for a human. But then but seems something's off. not something's not right. Something's not you, right. You, you, they pick up on something's not right with this picture. So and even voice. Too. Oh, they're like they're a cadence? lot of have that monotone, very yeah. um, kind of robotic yeah. voice that you know isn't human. So, in your mind, can you justify a connection between a possible extraterrestrial? You're and asking that, me this, and that <laughs> yes, hello? no, no, no. Hold on, you just jumped the gun. You don't even oh, hear well, it. Oh, well, well, a possible extraterrestrial being that needs permission to come in. Now, see, that's the part I'm not getting. Because how many stories do we That's have? That's the part I'm of, not getting of ETs and experiences like that, where they just take you. We'll just yeah. suffice it to say a tractor beam. I yeah. know that's cliche and not really appreciated, but they don't ask when they use a tractor beam. I and mean, there's numerous stories of crazy ways that they abduct people. Yeah. But why in this case do these these particular entities, whether or not they're a hybrid of some kind, need permission? Can you can you think of anything that would that would justify that on no. an extraterrestrial level? No. It seems like a more paranormal thing. Yeah. Doesn't it? Yeah. Like the acceptance of one's boundaries and then needing the invitation. Yeah. To me feels more paranormal than it does extraterrestrial. Yeah, but yeah definitely. Everything else on this on this character Space. does feel extraterrestrial. extraterrestrial. Yep. It really does. Yep. So you're welcome, Tristan. Thank you for the amazing episode comment. Oh, I didn't you. even see it. <laughs> we try as much as we can try. <laughs> so so that's where we're at. We're at uh, the perfect story. Oops. The perfect story to house so many possibilities with Could it. Be. And even, in, like I said, the, what, the one thing I got excited about, the, the biggest thing that I got excited about in this whole story is not the fact that how long have they been been around how long have stories been told Mm -hmm. but the fact that we can finally talk about a tulpa that no matter what it is we could be thinking i'm trying to think i just bought zelda breath of the wild so if we all think that princess zelda actually exists and in reality she only exists in your game console whatever it may be Mm -hmm. your nintendo entertainment system your switch whatever it is if we all collectively believe that she is a literal person in theory if we give her enough spiritual energy in 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 she will manifest. She will manifest in a physically. physical form. And you could shake her hand. Yeah. You know, so that was the biggest thing for me that even even if you don't believe that they're real, that they're completely made up, this made up thing could become real. Mind blown. Anything? No, no. I was reading Trista's <laughs> comment. That's the Winchester <laughs> salt circle demon kind of thing, right? Oh yeah, me and Trista slinging but what the if it's salt. Not? But what? That's the thing. What if it's not? Because every it fits a criteria of extraterrestrial all the way. Which your your salt circle won't freaking help. Not unless no, they're like yeah. slugs and you throw it on. They just sizzle. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So like, what? Where do we settle? <clears throat> Can you settle on this? What do you think? I don't know. I I really don't know. Like when when I hear black eyed kids, yeah, it it I instinctively make that connection with Men in Black, and this has got to be something extraterrestrial. Huh? Um, is it possibly that they need permission to cross through dimension? I don't know, because like you said, in in for people that have had contact with ETs. You know, they, it's not like they came down and said, would you be all right if we just kind of came go, every couple months and, bloop, bloop, bloop. <laughs> you know, there's there's not that conversation that takes place. Um, so why then did these energies, these entities, beings, whatever these things are, why do they need to ask? Why do they need your permission mm-hmm. to podcast dog do anything to you? Yep. And, f- and furthermore. Uh, I don't think we really touched on it, and we probably should have. We I think we did in the script a little bit, but we should have done it more in the live. Um, 
whenever they come up to a house, which nine times out of ten, a lot of these stories revolve around it being late and them coming up to your house and knocking on the door. Yeah. The one thing that they usually ask for is to use your phone. Yeah. So we need to use your phone. And there have been updated stories of people being approached on the street and them asking them uh, to come to their house to use their phone and people responding with, oh, that's no problem. Here, use my cell phone. And then that pissing them off. Huh. Because they don't want to use your cell phone. No, that's they not need the agenda. To use your house phone. So whatever, um, whatever could be established when that happens is now being blocked by technology and the fact that oh it's fine you can call your parents from my phone, text them from my phone. Yeah. And then now, now that is not what they need to happen. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty funny seeing technology, technology actively getting in the way. Yeah. <laughs> that was a scary story. Yeah. Technology <laughs> might be saving us against uh, the black eyed kids. Yeah, here, use my cell yeah. phone. But I just want to say too is. Um, you know, with these plausible, I don't know about plausible, but, con- but but these theories of what these things could be, definitely check out the podcast on Tuesday um, because the story at the end, at the end, you guys are really going to want to hear. Yep. It's a good, it's a good story. Yeah. Like I said, it's nothing new. Don't, don't get over it. Except if you've listened to other podcasts about it, you probably already heard it, but it's a good, it's a good story. And it's our, like I said, it's only our, our only real story that gives us a insight to a possibly bad ending about one letting them in so yeah we're gonna let that out do we have anything else to talk about today i think that's it for this week okay if you have an idea of what you think the black eyed kids might be uh post it in here if you're in this live right now post it in um if you are part of our uh facebook group supernatural tendencies group on on facebook add it in there we don't care throw it up any way you want um if you can send us an email how do you how do you feel about it uh if you have any experiences yourselves that you can verify if not if you've heard a cool story we'll share it later it's fine we we would love to get to the point and this is my thing right here okay first off we originally started this podcast not wanting to do ads, especially in the beginning, because it's our hobby. Now, eventually, if we get big enough, we've put a lot of money, a lot of money oh, yeah. <laughs> into stuff for this podcast Podcasting to make it better. is not cheap. So eventually, if we get to the point that we can justify annoying our listeners with ads to get us some money, we may entertain that idea, but I don't want to do it here right off the bat. But what we would love to do right off the bat is have you email us What's your thoughts? What's your theories? If you have any personal stories, any ideas for shows, or anything you'd like to add, we will read them on here. Uh, we, Most definitely. We I think we say it in the outro, the pre-recorded outro that we do, but I think it's Supernatural Tendencies Podcast at gmail.com. We always want to push it because it's you don't it doesn't cost you anything. Um, if you don't want us to say your name, we won't say your name. Please put that at the top. You could probably put it in the title. It'll probably be best for us just so we don't mistakenly say your name. But you could share mm-hmm. whatever you want to share. We want to get the community as close to as we can. We are growing in that Facebook group. And so far, a lot of our listeners are not afraid to – oh, there's a truck going by – to – to get interactive with us. I mean, you're not you're not going to look dumb. You're not going to look crazy. We're, we're probably way more crazier than you are nine, nine times out of ten. So if you're listening to this on an audio form, we have about, I think it's estimated around 100-ish listeners per week. Mm-hmm. And we're going up. So we have like-minded individuals. Don't stick to just the audio format. Get on with us with the Facebook group. Give us a like. That's the only thing we really ask. And again, we're not even asking for money right now. We, we tossed around the idea of a Patreon. But again, we want our list listenership to be kind of intimate right now we don't want to bombard you with stuff every other anchor podcast you hear and this is no offense to them uh you hear that initial anchor ad or you hear another ad blah blah blah, and they got to make work you got to make ends meet i guess but honestly what they might you get paid out through some of those sponsorships it's not much and we do not want to uh throw that in your face every week until we know we can make it worth our while until then we're not going to do that but do us a favor Keep in contact, man. Give us an email. Comment on our Facebook page. Whatever you want to do, we're going to try to incorporate. We're constantly looking for new ideas to help do this stuff, which I wanted to post. I wanted to post a poll. We haven't talked about this yet. I wanted to post a poll this past week uh, because Daryl actually made the comment. God darn it. uh, Made the comment of, why do you still do the script? And uh, why don't you just do the script in the live form and then call it call it even don't do the the separated the separated podcast and to be honest that was the idea that we had starting out that was the format just to get this started we wanted to cohesively and simply give you the story until we started talking about it and and started ranting and raving or whatever we're going to do we then incorporated the live into that next part so uh we need to do the poll and if you have an opinion right now put it up right now should we just ditch the spoken script or or should we keep it 
Should we just go to this live where we kind of do the script through this live that we kind of do now? Or should we, do you guys actually enjoy the spoken script? Let us know. We've gotten some both ways. So keep letting us know, and maybe maybe we'll just ditch it. Maybe we won't do that anymore. Maybe we'll just do this this live scripting with a discussion involved. Yeah. But we're not going to stop the lives. You guys, don't worry. If you guys like the lives, we're not going to yeah, stop doing the lives. Yeah, we're not going to stop the lives. Yeah. Uh, but we, uh, we will not stop doing the Musician Spotlight. So this week, uh, if you're on the audio podcast, uh, stick around. This week we have Eerie Death Rattle. <laughs> I don't know what that was. <laughs> I don't know. Eerie Death Rattle. Uh, but I say that's where we call it an end for the day. What do you think? I think so. So be sure, guys, check us out Tuesday mornings. I usually get that up and posted about 10-ish on wherever you listen to your... That's the mom of the kittens, by the way. Podcast. She yeah. came out of the box. <laughs> so, yeah, we're on Spotify, uh iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeart. I don't even know where all we are anymore. Castbox, Stitcher. Yep, Spotify, yeah. we said. Yep. Yeah. Just about any major platform we're on. So if you know somebody that uses a different kind of one, show them how to do it. Uh, send them our way or send us their yeah. way. Hit However, that subscribe button. Oh, yeah. And leave us a comment. Leave us a review. We sure appreciate that. Um, but, yeah, I think that's it for this week. Heck, yeah, it's been a great episode. Thanks for joining us. Take care, guys. And we'll hopefully we'll see you again next week. Next next Sunday. Love you. S- see you then. Bye. We'd like to say thank you one more time for hopping on board with us this week. If you have any comments, questions, critiques, or suggestions for new topics, please send us an email at supernaturaltendenciespodcast at gmail.com. We also encourage you to get over to our Facebook page at Supernatural Tendencies Podcast and go ahead and elbow drop that like button for us. We're also available on Instagram at Supernatural Tendencies Podcast and Twitter at Weird and Scary, if that's more to your liking. Please pass us around to your friends as well, where they can find us on Apple Podcasts, CastBox, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and most other podcast platforms. And remember, if you're having any type of paranormal activity or extraterrestrial contact, I offer private coaching online via Skype or Facebook Messenger to assist you with those issues. Feel free to visit me at christyjohnsonsadler.com for contact information. Till next time, this has been Alex and Christy. See you later. Uh, here we are diving back in in a very noisy post show environment. We got a cat eating next to me. I got a dog running up and down linoleum in the hallway. It's, it's fine. It's anarchy. Though. It's fine. It, it it adds character to the sound the sound profile. It's fine. Uh, but we're pretty excited today uh, for a couple of reasons. I'm going to try to keep this short and sweet today because we're still in the midst of this pandemic and things are starting to open back up, but they're not fully open. So a lot of these bands probably start still aren't going to have things scheduled just yet but today as we've said before i almost had something spilled because of the cat uh we had eerie death rattle i believe we uh my band dirt worship had the pleasure of opening up for eerie death rattle maybe two years ago at frankie's inner city in toledo it's kind of our mainstay for a while so a lot of my stories she dropped the wood behind me so <laughs> it was the same cat like i said very noisy environment eerie death rattle Actually, they're doing some recording with the White Elephant Records, which when I had initially emailed Eerie Death Rattle, they referred me to, to oh my gosh, I had her name. Oh my gosh. To Alicia Adams. So Alicia, if you're listening to this, thank you so much for your beautiful correspondence. I usually don't get very much information from some of these bands. And not only did she give me some more information about Eerie Death Rattle or the, the tracks and stuff, permission to use to use other stuff for promotional purposes, she also gave me some other bands to use. She also said she has more bands lined up for me when we need them. So more than likely from here on out, we may have a lot of White Elephant Records oh, cool. bands coming up for us. Uh, today, today, though, we do have Eerie Death Rattle. We want to give them their moment. To be honest, I don't know where they're from. I know we opened up for them in Toledo, but their Facebook page... Does not say where they're from. White Elephant Records is, I believe, Big City or Big Rapids, Michigan, uh, which is north of Grand Rapids, Michigan. 
in between actually i have family from mid michigan mount pleasant six lakes area which is going to be just east of there so it's west of mount pleasant if any of you have ever heard of that place and then just north of grand rapids which you've probably heard of in the what the western side of the mitten right and it seems to be pretty legit man like they put out some quality stuff i'm enjoying it eerie death rattle in particular I I would probably venture to describe it as like a what like a like a '90s alternative yeah throwback I would say yeah yeah it's pretty good stuff like I don't I want to see like like um oh my gosh who did uh oh no oh. hey man nice shot was a filter kind of filterish kind of smashing pumpkins ish yeah. so in that same vein so if you like that kind of stuff you're gonna like this stuff today they've given us the song slightly to use so if you get a chance hop on spotify give them a couple of listens i'm sure they have stuff on Bandcamp. buy some merch as we've pushed every show during this pandemic give an artist some money for their stuff if you've never done it before do it now because they need it now so give eerie death rattle some love all the way around whether it be listens subscribes likes or outright purchases without any further ado we will play it now thank you again to miss alicia adams uh thank you again to eerie death rattle here it is slightly play it it's when i roll a situation lightly it's when i calm down ever so slightly don't make me breathe, make me breathe for myself Hey there, go with your hair hanging down What you trying to prove? Hey there, go with your hair swinging around Don't need no trouble from you What you trying to prove and you're gonna blame Yeah. 